Hmm. Secret. A secret. A secret. The year is 1964. Four years after the first live-action movie of Tintin, there was to be a sequel. Some changes in the casting have been made. Jean-Bierre Talbot reprises his role as Tintin, but the part of Captain Haddock and Professor Calculus were recast. You can especially see this on Captain Haddock as Jean Boisse has a different face than Georges Wilson. Not even the beard could hide that, but it looks better in this movie. And the title of the adventure was Tintin and the Blue Oranges. Professor Calculus makes a dramatic call on television. All scientists of the world should unite to combat starvation. After this, heaps of letters arrive in Marlin Spike Hall with ideas and suggestions about what to do. Among the letters is a package that does not include a note. In it there's an orange, but the orange is blue and it glows in the dark. The sender is some Professor Zalamea from Spain. So Tintin, Snowy, Haddock and Calculus go to Spain to uncover the secret of the orange. And when they arrive, they find out that Professor Zalamea had been kidnapped. And it doesn't take long for Calculus to disappear as well. In Tintin and the Golden Fleece, foreign languages were used timidly to reflect the local color. So they were not translated, but subtitled. The same is done in Tintin and the Blue Oranges, but much more. And the Spanish landscapes just look beautiful. Drawings from the comics were also integrated as an optical gag. The painting of Haddock's ancestor Francis, drawn by Hergé, hangs in Marlin Spike Hall. And the poster of Bianca Castafiore also shows an Hergé drawing. As for the rest, well. First of all, the premise of the movie is worthy of a Tintin story and it is certainly one of the many issues that Hergé cares about. Stopping worldwide starving. But then the story glides down into slapstick and very forced slapstick, so to speak. In places, characters absolutely behave out of character. For example, at one point the villains have tied Thompson and Thompson together and instead of helping them, Captain Haddock laughs at them. Sure, Haddock had his problems with the Thompsons and called them clowns and such, but here he is just mean. Interestingly, René Goscinny, the author of Asterix, was involved in the script of the film. But this is nothing to be proud of, I think. To be honest, I can't see the spirit of Goscinny anywhere. He had a different kind of humor. It's also interesting that Goscinny worked on this Tintin movie, although Asterix, the comic series, had already achieved a certain degree of fame at the time, and Asterix and Tintin were competitors in their field. What is also annoying is that it isn't revealed who is behind the kidnapping. The big boss is only heard over loudspeakers, and you can only see his stupid henchman. As you can see, I am not very fond of this movie. My critique would have been softener if they would have revealed that a live-action Roberto Rastapopoulos was the bad guy after all. Instead, Bianca Castafiore has a relatively senseless short appearance in which she portrays Margaret and Haddock as Mephisto to confuse the Spanish police. Yes, this is a thing that happens in this movie. And I'm awfully sorry that I can't give this movie a better rating. It's really only for the hardcore fans who want to complete their collection. <sighs> Everyone else, well, think for yourself. The story has a very strong beginning and a very good motive, but then it just goes down the drain, in my opinion. Unfortunately, this was the last Tintin live-action movie there was never a sequel.